Hi Church, it's so good to be with you this morning uh, and to be live uh, from the studio here. I hope you're managing uh, to keep warm. You know, this week I was thinking about songs and how powerful songs can be in bringing people hope. Um, think of a song like, you know, I Will Survive by Gloria Gaynor or uh, The Eye of the Tiger. Now, I've never run the Comrades Marathon, but I, I reckon if I had Eye of the Tiger in my ears, I wouldn't even need to train and I probably could run uh, the Comrades Marathon. It's just one of those songs that gets you moving, gets you vibing, and uh, yeah, it's just one of those classics. But also think of some of the songs that were sung during the struggle against apartheid. I mean, songs that were actually banned by the South African government. That's how powerful songs can be. I think of songs, you know, by Hugh Masekela or Miriam Makeba, uh, Brenda Fossey, uh, even the late Johnny Clegg. And uh, then when we think of even international songs like Eddie Grant's song from 1988, you know, Give Me Hope, Joanna, which actually was a song uh, about our city of Johannesburg. And so these songs brought hope to the people uh, as they were struggling against uh, apartheid. So when we think of a song like Shosha Loza, uh, the late Nelson Mandela used to sing that song on Robben Island as he was forced uh, to labor there. And in his autobiography, Mandela says that uh, he described Shosha Loza as a song that compares the apartheid struggle to the motion of an oncoming train. And he went on to explain that the singing of the song made the work lighter. And just think about that, that the power that a song can actually make work in those conditions lighter. So this morning, I wanted us to look at a powerful song of hope. It's a song that the people of God have been singing for thousands of years, and it comes from the Old Testament. In fact, it's a, a song of ascent, and maybe this song could become our lockdown song. So it's a song about learning to rest in God. And I've come back to it again and again during the season with all the noise that's going on. So what is a song of ascent? Well, the Psalms of Ascent were uh, a collection of 15 Psalms from Psalm 120 through to Psalm 134. And uh, they were sung by the people of God as they ascended and went up to the temple. And when I was in Israel a number of years ago, we were able to even stand on those stairs and we would recite the first verse of each of these psalms as we went up the step towards the temple. And so these songs brought hope to God's people. They, they were able to, after captivity, remember that they were once in Babylon, unable to worship God, unable to go to the temple. And these songs were reminders of God's victory and God's power and God's freedom. They were also songs of gratitude. And in this season, we need to not only be focused on what's wrong, but also grateful for what God is doing. So these are powerful songs. And so this morning, I want to just study one of them. It's a very short song, and it's Psalm 131. So let's read this from the Word of God together. Psalm 131. A song of ascents of David. Verse 1. My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. But I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, both now and forevermore. What a beautiful picture. David gives us of contentment, this, this picture of serenity, of him being at rest on God's lap, like a weaned child with his mother. And we know from verse 3 that this reference is to God. He's likening God to a mother and David is resting there content. He's found deep soul satisfaction despite all of the noise that's going on in the world around him. It's no wonder then that the Israelites picked up this very personal song. I mean, this was a song David had written in his quiet time. This was him and God alone. And now this had become part of the worship book of Israel. Because regularly, about three times a year, as they went up to the temple and they sang this song, it would have brought them hope and joy. As they left the daily battles behind and went into God's presence and rested again, this song brought them hope as they reminded themselves of who God is. And then as they left the temple and they went back to daily life, this song inspired them with hope. 
But you and I have this privilege as New Testament people with the Holy Spirit within us. We don't have to go to a temple. We are the temple of God. God's Spirit is within us and we can experience this kind of joy and peace wherever we are and at any time of the day or night. And that's our privilege. So can I ask you a question this morning? For each of you who are watching this live right now, when last has your soul been quiet? When last has your soul been really quiet? Not fighting, not agonizing, not thinking furiously, not in turmoil, but simply quiet, at calm, at rest, at peace, content. And that's why this is a psalm that, that I've been coming back to. Because we're surrounded by the, the beeping of our messages that are going off. We're surrounded by news feeds that are scrolling past Facebook notifications, cries that are screaming for our attention, their deadlines we have to meet, their bills to pay, there's decisions that we have to make, there's pressures to be dealt with, there's burdens that we have to bear, and there's fears that it feels as though we have to fear those fears. And so we've got all this noise going around. But I don't know about you, I, I thought when we went into lockdown that lockdown might bring me rest. It's a change of pace, but I've actually found that my sleep has been more disturbed in this season than, than in any other time in my life. Uh, I'm certainly not like a weaned child. I feel like a little baby who can't sleep through the night. And, 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 and I think it's just the weight of the world that feels like it's on my shoulders. And maybe you feel like that too in this season. Maybe there's relational conflict. Maybe there's challenges in your family. Maybe there's financial difficulties. Maybe there's just opening social media and seeing these polarizing opinions as you read the comments and you just feel so discouraged, maybe even frustrated. And then there's just the season of uncertainty. How long is this going to go on for? And then as we look out to the events in the world, in the US and other parts of the globe, as we see what's happening in our own country, it's easy to just feel this burden of weight crushing down upon us. I think for many of us, we think that perhaps if our external circumstances change for the better, then we will know contentment. But if there's one thing I've learned from Psalm 131, it's that rest and contentment is a state of the heart. It's not dependent on external circumstances and David models that for us. Psalm 131 cuts across the noise and it just gently whispers to us, you can know God in this season. You can actually know peace and rest and contentment even in the midst of a pandemic. God is here and if we can't find God in these moments, where and when will we find Him? You know, Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher, once said, this is one of the shortest psalms, but one of the longest to implement in one's life. And I think that's very true. So how do you learn to rest in God? That's the question that I want us to ask of this passage. How do you learn to rest in God? Number one, embrace your limits. Embrace your limits. And that's a very humbling thing. Look at verse one again. David says, my heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. So the first step in resting in God is to realize that you are not God. And it seems so obvious. And, and yes, we know that intellectually, but we don't really believe that in our hearts. Because that's what pride seeks to do. Pride seeks to dethrone God and to put self on the throne that, that is ultimately God's throne. And I don't think any of us as God's children wake up in the morning and intellectually believe, hey, I'm God. But I think our hearts still believe that. And it manifests itself in the way that we are so restless, in the way that we're striving and maybe facing anxiety and worry. It's evidence that actually our hearts believe that we want to be in control. We want to be omnipotent, like God. We want to be all-powerful. We want to be sovereign. We want to be omnipresent. We want to be omniscient. We want to know all things. We want to be able to figure out all things. And yet that is the prerogative of God alone. We're trying to take the place of God. And no wonder we're not coping. No wonder we're feeling just so overwhelmed. That's a role we were never meant to play. How can a mortal, frail man be God? 
We're trying to be the Messiah and trying to control everything. And I've been guilty of that in this season. And there's been things I've needed to repent of. Pride is self-sufficiency. Pride is saying, in practice, I don't actually need God. And so David writes, O Lord, my heart is not proud. It's not proud. Perhaps David was writing this in the season when Saul was hunting him down. You know, Saul was accusing David of selfish ambition. Hey, David, you just want to be king and you want to take the throne away from me. And who do you think you are? But we know that that wasn't true of David. Because David even had the opportunity to kill Saul in that cave and he didn't. David refused to play God. David refused to literally put himself on the throne. He refused to put himself on the throne figuratively and spiritually as well. He entrusted himself to God. And even though God had promised him, you will be king, he didn't want to take matters into his own hands and he rested in God's sovereignty. So if this is the context of Psalm 131, then David is absolutely true when in his private quiet time he says to God, Lord, you know my heart, my heart is not proud. Yes, we know there were other times when David was proud and he messed up, but here he could truly say, Lord, my heart is not proud. But David also shows us a progression to pride. Pride starts in the heart and then it moves to the eyes and then it moves out into action. So David says, my heart is not proud. That's the root of pride. It's pride in relation to self. That's where it starts. It is birthed in the heart as we begin to dwell on who we are and we think that we're greater than we really are. And then pride moves to the eyes. David says, my eyes are not haughty. And that's pride now in relation to others. So what starts in the heart with just me moves to the eyes and then we begin to look down on other people. That's at the root of so much injustice in the world and racism is superiority. The pride of my heart moves to my eyes and I begin to look down on others. Charles Spurgeon said, Pride very often leads to haughtiness, domineering ways towards others and contempt of them, as if they were not as good as we are. And if we see any errors and mistakes in them, we conclude that they are very foolish and that we would act much better if we were in their position. I'd hate to be the president. How many of us think, hey, if we were in his position, we would do this or do that? And then Spurgeon goes on and says, if they act nobly and well, this same pride of ours leads us to pick holes in them and to detract from their excellence. And if we cannot get up as high as they are, we try to pull them down to our level. So pride begins in the heart, it moves to the eyes, and then it moves to the feet. It moves out into action. David says, I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. Literally, the Hebrew says, I do not walk. I do not walk in matters too great. I do not walk in things too wonderful for me. And that's when pride now begins to manifest itself in outward ways, in hostility towards God. Actually, as we walk and strut our stuff, not only is pride in the heart, not only is it in the eyes, but it's in the way that we're living. And we're saying, God, I want to run my own life. I want to be in control. I want to know what's happening. But David, by contrast, has learned to be okay with mystery. Are you okay with mystery? I know what it's like for me. I hate being in suspense. I always want to figure out some puzzle or, or you know, get to the conclusion of some cliffhanger ending in a movie. But David says, I'm okay with mystery, Lord. Lord, I'm okay not to know. Lord, I'm okay if I can't figure everything out. There are some things, Lord, that you have placed beyond my grasp, beyond my sphere of understanding. And Lord, I trust your wisdom. Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God. There are some secret things and they belong to the Lord our God. And I don't believe you will ever know the true contentment of a child in verse 2 if you haven't first embraced this truth of verse 1 that you cannot look into things that are beyond your reach, the secret things of God. Can you fathom all of God's mysteries? Can you probe the depths of God's sovereignty? You know, think of Job back in the Old Testament as he wrestled with mystery and suffering and, and questions that he had. Job chapter 42 and verse 3, we read that God asks him, 
Who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? And what does Job reply? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. Tim Keller puts it this way, Spiritual pride is the illusion that we are competent to run our own lives, achieve our own sense of self-worth, and find a purpose big enough to give us meaning in life without God. Keller says, if you try to put anything in the middle of the place that was originally made for God, it's going to be too small. It's going to rattle around in there. You and I were made for God. We were not made to put ourselves on the throne. And so if God's not central, anything else we put in that in his place is going to rattle around in there. C.S. Lewis says something similar. He says, all that we call human history, money, poverty, ambition, war, prostitution, Classes, empires, slavery is the long, terrible story of man trying to find something other than God which will make him happy. We're always on the search to find something other than God which will make us happy until God redeems us and renews us. But we must find our satisfaction in Him. So to those of you that are watching, as you carry the weight of the world on your shoulders, Maybe you're a mother, maybe you're a father, as a citizen of this country, maybe you're an educator, maybe you're just a leader of some sphere, maybe you, you feel this burden as a provider and you just feel the weight of the world. I want to challenge you from David's example to embrace your limits. Embrace your limits. We already have a Messiah and you and I are not him. We are not the Messiah. We have a Messiah. There's a t-shirt that reads, two unchangeable truths. One, there is a God, and two, you're not Him. So why do we believe that the more I do, the more I control, the more I have, the more I know, the more content I'll be? It's just not true. It's an illusion. Stephen Curtis Chapman wrote a beautiful song a number of years ago. It's called, God is God. And I'd like to read some of the lyrics to you. Chapman sings, and the pain falls like a curtain on the things I once called certain. And I have to say the words I fear the most, I just don't know. And the questions without answers come and paralyze the dancer. So I stand here on the stage afraid to move, afraid to fall. Oh, but fall I must on this truth that my life has been formed from the dust. God is God and I am not. I can only see a part of the picture he's painting. God is God and I am man, so I'll never understand it all, for only God is God. Can I form a single mountain, take the stars in hand and count them? Can I even take a breath without God giving it to me? He is first and last before all that has been, beyond all that will pass. God is God and I am not. I can only see a part of the picture that he's painting. God is God and I am man, so I'll never understand it all, for only God is God. The truth of verse 1 of Psalm 131 is that until you quit trying to be God, until you've embraced your limits, until you've truly come to the end of yourself, you will never fully embrace God. You will never fully know the contentment of which David speaks. You don't need answers. What you need is comfort, God's comfort. So if you want to learn to rest in God, number one, embrace your limits. That's very humbling. And number two, embrace your God. Embrace your God. And that's really, really comforting. And that's verse two of our text. David says, but I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother. And then he repeats it, like a weaned child, I am content. David's being really honest here. He's admitting that he used to be like a screaming baby. He was all agitated, all worked up. He was inconsolable, but he has calmed and quieted himself on the lap of his God. He's found contentment in the presence of God, like a weaned child with his mother. Now in Hebrew culture, 
weaning was a really important milestone. And I believe that once a child in a family was weaned, the family would throw a massive party of celebration because this was an important milestone. This was the first step that, that this human life had taken towards maturity. And in a day and age when uh, infant mortality rates were really high, for a child to survive through this season was a great uh, reason for, for rejoicing because this child was now healthy and moving on to greater things. I think there's no more serene picture than having a child at rest. And I can think back when my girls were small and they were just resting on my chest. You didn't want to move. You just wanted to take a photo and just capture that moment. There was just a beauty and a serenity of seeing a child just at peace and at rest on the chest of a mom or a dad. But by contrast, what does an unweaned child look like? And maybe some of you are struggling to watch this right now because uh, the kids are, are going wild. But an unweaned child is restless. Uh, I mean, they're all over the place. They have sudden mood swings and, and every little uh, stomach grumble is, is, is a cause for them crying out. They, they have immediate, immediate needs and they want those needs to be met and they're going to make it known. Babies don't know about waiting patiently. Babies don't know about having a discussion. Hey, mom, what's for supper tonight? They want it and they want it now. And weaning is a process. It's this ongoing process. Weaning doesn't happen overnight. And perhaps if we were really honest, we should say, I am like a weaning child. David could say I'm like a weaned child, but I think this is a process for us as God's children that we're on that we're being weaned from self and from sin. Just think about a baby. Weaning is its first experience of loss, deep loss. And that this baby is probably thinking to itself, mom doesn't know what she's doing. Mom, if I was mom, I would do a different job from mom. You know, uh, up until now, uh, mom has been this immediate source of nourishment and comfort. But now, mom's providing still for the child, but in a different way, in a less immediate way. The weaned child moves beyond milk and onto solid foods. Just think about this child lying in comfort on mom's lap, not frantically saying, hey, where's the breast? Where can I find the milk? Just receiving comfort because they've been weaned from mom in that sense. And they're just able to rest contently. So can I ask you, who are you most like? Are you like the unweaned child who worries and kicks and screams and pouts? Or are you in this process of being weaned from self and from sin? Are you able to wait? Are you able to just rest and trust God and say, Lord, I trust your wisdom because I know that you are God. I know that you will provide in your time. I think one of the hardest lessons I've had to learn, and it's one that I keep coming back to and have learned over and over again, is can I be satisfied with God? Not with God's gifts, not with what He gives me, but can I be satisfied with just Him? And I remember that season when I lay in ICU and I just narrowly escaped with my life in those moments as I thought I might never be able to walk again, I might never be able to preach again, I might never be able to serve God again. I might never be able to do ministry in His name. Can I rest and be content in just who God is? And that's a challenging soul-searching question. Is God enough for you? And if God sometimes says no to some of your prayers, can you still love Him? You know, you're a human being before you are a human doing. And sometimes we think that we've got to be doing stuff for God, but this place of just resting being a man or a woman of God that precedes doing what God wants you to do is a wonderful thing. Then they're not in polar opposites. We do need to do, but that's got to flow from a place of being. And I think a season like this exposes my immaturity and it exposes yours too as well, I'm sure. Because it shows us that we have an infantile view of ourselves and we have an infantile view of God. And God wants to wean us from those infantile views. Just imagine for a moment with me an immature adult. Maybe some of you watching are in your 20s. Imagine if you'd never been weaned. Imagine as a 20-something, you still were dependent on your mother's breast. If you were still breastfeeding. I mean, it's a ludicrous thought. 
I mean, attachment parenting is popular in some circles. And I remember back in 2012, Time magazine had this article, this front page of this child breastfeeding on its mother. And attachment parenting, I've seen mothers bragging that their 10-year-olds are still breastfeeding. You know, it's like, I don't want to get them, I don't want to wean them. They must just wean whenever they're ready. But friends, that's immaturity. There's something wrong when we don't want to wean from self and from sin. Saying, hey, my will, my perspective, my way, my smarts, my experience, my agenda, my timetable. The weaned child no longer sees God or their mom as just a means of food. Up until this point, mom has just been this glorified milk-making machine. But now they realize mom is a person. She's somebody whose presence I can enjoy. It's somebody whose relationship I can have. I can get to know her. Mom is more than just this provider of milk. And the contented worshiper is one who desires God for God's sake alone, not for what God can just give them. And contentment is resting quietly in that God. Spurgeon wrote again, as only he can write, he said, the transition from a sucking infant to a weaned child, from squalling baby to quiet son or daughter, is not smooth. It is stormy and noisy. It's no easy thing to quieten yourself. Sooner may a person calm the sea or rule the wind or tame a tiger than quieten oneself. It is pitched battle. The baby is denied expected comforts and flies into rages or sinks into sulks. There's sobs and struggles. The infant is facing its first great sorrow and it is in sore distress. But to the weaned child, his mother is his comfort, though she has denied him comfort. It is a blessed mark of growth out of spiritual infancy when we can forego the joys which once appeared to be essential and can find our solace in him who denies them to us. What a powerful, challenging picture of what maturity looks like. And you know what the unweaned child doesn't realize? They are being weaned to experience far deeper, far greater, soul-satisfying joys than they could have ever imagined. I mean, think about it. They're being weaned so that they can experience solid food, steaks and cheeseburgers and pizzas and popcorn and all sorts of amazing vegetables and fruits that they haven't yet tasted. God wants to wean us from sin and self, not to make us miserable, but because he has deeper desires for us, because he has greater joys for us to experience. The Psalms tell us that he has pleasures at his right hand, and yet we settle for living on milk for the whole of our lives. How miserable. That's why John Piper's ministry could be summarized with this one single statement, because this has been Piper's passion to get us to be satisfied with God. I think we can summarize Piper's ministry in his own words. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. God is most glorified in me because when I'm satisfied in Him, He gets the glory. So God is glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. So can I ask one last question? Does resting in God mean that we just become passive? Does this kind of contentment mean that we just stop speaking hope to the world? We just bury our heads in the sand. We don't see the injustices in society. We don't speak against the evil. Is that what David's saying here? I don't think so, because there's one last verse, and that's verse 3. David ends the psalm by desiring that others experience the same hope. He says, Israel, put your hope in the Lord both now and forevermore. And I believe that it is the people who have experienced this kind of peace, this kind of hope and joy and contentment, who can bring this hope to others. They are the ones who can speak peace and calm and sanity to the world. Israel, put your hope in the Lord. That's what David's doing. I've experienced this. Uh, Israel, I want you to experience this as well. I think there are enough noisy voices in the world shouting out from a place of unrest. And yet here's David, recognizing that he can't give away what he doesn't already have, and neither can you. It's those who know peace with God and the peace of God 
who are able to point people to the only hope that there is, the Lord Jesus Christ in the gospel. Hope in the Lord for both now and hope forevermore. So I believe Psalm 131 invites you to come and rest in God's arms afresh, satisfied just to be there, to be weaned on Him rather than from Him. To just be satisfied to know that He is greater, that He is stronger than all the noise in your world right now. And I don't know what noise you're experiencing. Some of you I know are going through deep waters. And so I bring this psalm in the hope that this psalm would be your new song. Satisfied just to be satisfied in Him. So let me close with a, a story. And I think I may have shared this with you on one occasion before. It's a story from a number of years ago. And we were leaving a, a restaurant after a lovely meal and uh, we were walking behind this family and as I looked at this family I could see this little girl there with her hand in her dad's hands and I reckon she was about five years old. And in her other hand she was holding this balloon on a stick. And we followed them because we were going out to the parking area to where our car was parked. And uh, as you might have guessed, as we rounded the final little corner out to the parking area, this little girl's balloon just brushed against the rough edges of some bricks. And with the briefest and loudest of swan songs, her little balloon was no more. Now I could tell before that by her little skip that she must have been smiling, even though I couldn't see her face. But now she just absolutely froze. She was in such shock and the, the, the explosion had startled her. She didn't even have time to cry. She didn't have time to whimper. I just saw a little head turn and all she saw was this plastic stick that once held this balloon. And as she walked to her car, I could just see that her, her walk was now as deflated as her balloon was. And my heart went out to this little girl. That was until I saw what was, had been in front of me the whole time, but I hadn't yet noticed. My little girl also had a balloon, but my little girl didn't view her balloon in the same light as this little girl. And so I knew what I had to do. As this family went towards their car, I took my little girl's balloon and I ran towards the family and I handed it to the little girl and I said to her, do you want this? And her parents said to me, are you sure? And if I was ever sure of anything, it was that particular night. And I said, yes, please take it. And I could see this little girl, her whole disposition completely changed as they drove off. I saw the little balloon bobbing in the car and you could just sense that this girl was so happy because she was so different now. Not just different because her outlook had changed, but so different from my daughter. You know, my little girl willingly gave her balloon away. My little girl didn't cling to her balloon, so when it was gone, she had actually not really lost anything. My little girl didn't think that her whole world revolved around a balloon. And you know why that is? It's not because my little girl didn't like balloons. It's not because I'm such a great dad that I brought her up in an amazing way. It's not even because she's so spiritual. It's because at that time, my little girl was only three months old. Three months old. And all she clung to was the love of her parents and the nourishment that we could give her. Nothing more and nothing less. And you know, I've come to realize that I think when we think about our Father, God the Father wants us to cling simply to His love and His nourishment for our daily needs, nothing more and nothing less. And I wonder how much time and energy I've wasted crying over burst balloons which became my world. Now that little three-month-old baby is now grown up. She's now 19 years old and just a couple of days ago she drove my car into a pothole on Bayes Nordia and she didn't burst a balloon, she burst my tire and we've had to split the cost half-half but that's another story for another day. But I want to challenge you as we close. Why not make Psalm 131 your lockdown song? Maybe write it down. Maybe somebody out there wants to compose a tune to it. Maybe you want to memorize it. Why not make this song your song of hope? that gives you the energy and inspires hope to come again and to rest in God. So that's this wonderful encouragement from this passage. Let's pray together as we ask God to minister to us. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this time in your word. We thank you for this short psalm. But yet, Lord, we know how long it takes to implement this in our lives. Lord, it's a lifetime process of being weaned from self 
Oh Lord, day after day, we continually want to put ourselves back on the throne. We want to be in control, Lord. We sometimes doubt your goodness. We doubt your love. And I pray that, Lord, amidst all of this noise, we would just cry out the psalm to you in the night when we're feeling alone, when we're feeling helpless, Lord, when we've come to the end of ourselves. Lord, help us to realize that then we can truly find rest in you. Lord, even for the activists in our midst who, who are out there doing, 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 Lord, may we recognize that there are seasons and times when we must come back home. Lord, even as that one singer sings, the warrior is a child. Lord, people don't know that we need to come back. They look at us and maybe they think that we're strong, but Lord, remind us that we need to come back and we need fresh strength from your spirit, fresh enabling to go out and to face our daily battles. Give us this peace, Lord, as we embrace our limits and as we then come and embrace our great God. Do a new work in us as we sing the song, Lord, in the days that lie ahead, because we pray this in your name. Amen.